everyone. Uh, Jenica Watt here, uh, Boost HR Advisor um, for Dominion Payroll, and I'm joined by Josh Ard, who is our Director of Business Development for Boost and Assist, which are our white glove services um, for payroll and for HR consulting. Um, you may have been with us on our previous webinars where we um, dug deep into the FLSA overtime uh, threshold increases and our recommendations. Um, recently, those rules went through and were confirmed with some exceptions. So we wanted to provide an update um, and hop on here uh, to just walk through, review what we reviewed briefly on the other webinar and walk through any updates, uh, as well as recommendations and um, things that might happen should you not comply. Uh, welcome, Josh. Great. Thank you, Jenica. And, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Um, uh, I know this has been a, a very uh, trending topic when it comes to HR and probably one of the more popular topics that, uh, that we have encountered in, in the past few years, I, I would say. Uh, just simply due to how many employers that this is going to affect or this has or, or has already affected as of July 1st. Um, but like Jenica mentioned, what we'll do is we'll just have a, a brief overview of what has changed and then talk about preparation that needs to happen uh, if you've started that already or if, if you're continuing to do so. Um, and then we'll look at uh, some frequently asked questions at the end. If you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to enter them in the chat. If it's something that we cannot get to uh, due to time, then we will follow up with you and uh, reach out directly. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just looking at, you know, th this is just a, a snapshot kind of, of of the history of of the Fair Labor Standards Act and their attempts and increases of the salary threshold over the years. You know, um, when it comes to exemption categories, they've actually been around for a very long time. Um, actually, back starting back to like the 30s and 40s, uh, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, but what we're going to look at today is what uh, specifically relates to the salary increase. Uh, the first phase happened on July 1st, and the second phase is scheduled for January 1st of 2025. Um, a lot we get a lot of questions asking about you know uh, court challenges or you know is, is this being challenged in the courts and yes um there, there are several cases uh being challenged down in the federal or i think it's the fifth district uh in texas and this was also the same district that um issued an injunction back in 2016 uh, when a similar increase was proposed but um as of right now, and Jenna and I were uh, discussing this earlier, there are um, three to four cases that are that are currently active right now. Um, there has been one case that they've issued a, a temporary stay on, uh, but this only involves Texas state employees. So as far as private employers, which I think a majority of the attendees today are, um, this that that case will not affect private employers nationally. Now, th this may set a precedent. Um, this, this is something that we're going to watch and monitor very closely um, to, to see if anything changes, because as we know, things can change very quickly. Um, another thing is that we're in an election year and uh, there could be an administration change, which could also influence um, these increases or proposed increases. So we will keep we will monitor that closely and let you know if anything does change. It's um, similar to the Supreme Court determining that they no longer have to defer to an administration administrative agency's interpretation of the law when it's silent mm -hmm. or ambiguous. So it's kind of interesting to see that these state federal judges are um, kind of making moves with this, and they're. This only applies, I just want to reiterate, this only applies to those state of Texas employees. Um, so right now it applies to everybody else. And I do think that we will see copycat lawsuits popping up. There are already still, there are still some in Texas that may be rolled into the existing ruling from that uh, mm. Texas judge. So there's a lot that will still happen, but we 
this change, the July 1 change for all other employers that are not state of, of Texas employees will go forward as scheduled or has gone forward yes. as scheduled. Yes, very, very good point. And, and we had anticipated that um, how this, this final rule was proposed that the July 1st or the first phase increase would be likely to happen because it was, it's a, an increase that's on the schedule that they have made increases prior um, in, in years prior. So we anticipated that this may go through, but the, um, the January 1st uh, increase or second phase of this final rule is something that we're going to monitor very closely because it's a very drastic increase. So we, we expect that this, there may be more challenges uh, to the January 1st increase, but like I said earlier, we will, we will monitor that and, and, you know, keep everyone updated if things do change. And the um, idea behind that concern with the salary threshold getting so high is that it would um, overshadow the actual duties test, which is what most feel should be stressed, uh, you know, most strongly in terms of determining that exemption status. Um, yes, great point, so great point. Um, but, you know, just to review very briefly, you know, what changed on July 1st, and, and like Jenica said, th this is in place. Um, this is something that uh, we're finding that a lot of employers are actively engaged in this process of understanding uh, trying to interpret um, what the final rule is. Um, we, we found out honestly too that a lot of employers, even though that this this increase to the salary threshold, the exemption, um, the EAP exemptions have been active for some time, but I think it's been very enlightening for employers because they've realized that this is something they haven't been, they haven't properly understood in the past. Therefore, they, they have not been in compliance. Uh, but I think that this this new final rule, if there is an advantage to this, it is that employers it's bringing it to light, you know. So now employers can have that opportunity to, you know, properly move forward, you know, to to do their analysis. It gives them the opportunity to really truly assess and update jobs that may not have been visited or looked over in a while, you know, or may have changed since they were originally classified. Sure, sure that. It, Exactly. And so, you know, just to say, you know, I know most of you are aware of this, but just to quickly overview um, what ha what is in place right now as of July 1, um, the salary threshold has increased from 684 per week to 844 per week. Um, so and, and the reason why it's stated there on a weekly basis is because the federal government or the DOL um, evaluates overtime on a work week basis. And that's any seven day continuous period. Um, most often, I think we find that most employers will run from Sunday to Saturday, but it could just be dependent upon your, uh, your business, your organization, your industry. Um, so this is what's changed thus far. Now, also, there is an increase to the highly compensated employee exemption. So that is increased, I think, from 107,000 to 100, well, practically one hundred and thirty three thousand dollars. So this is something that if you have employees that are falling in that high, high comp exempt uh, category, you know, that's something you need to review as well. Um, let's jump on. One Go ahead, thing to point out, yeah, just when we're looking at the numbers here, one thing to point out, there are several states who have a salary level threshold higher than um, the federal one. <clears throat> and so just make sure um, if you look at the states where you have a presence, so if you're in California, if you're in Colorado, if you're in New York, Washington, take a look. Um, the, there are also a couple of states who have, and we'll talk, touch on the duties test, but there are a couple of states who have a slightly different duties test or some uh, additions to it. So just make sure that you are not just looking at the federal, but also where your state presence is. Excellent point. That that brings us right into uh, the review of, you know, what is an exempt employee? You know, and, and I think this is really where a lot of the confusion comes in and, and understandably so. It's, it, it's, it's, this is not easy to understand. Um, I want you to, um, I want you to understand that because as HR professionals, you know, it's all we can do to interpret this as well. Um, but the, this is where I think the common misunderstanding falls is an exempt employee 
we're talking about the salary uh, part or the salary increase today because that's what's being updated. Um, but please understand that for an employee to be deemed exempt, they would actually have to meet the salary and the duties test, you know, and, and the duties test is something we've reviewed on the calls before, but, you know, look at the salary threshold, but don't just stop there. You know, if they are meeting the salary threshold or in excess of that threshold, then make sure you go through the analysis to look at, you know, what are their present duties? Um, this may involve looking at job descriptions um, and to see what they're currently doing. And I know that's not the most fun thing that, that, that people like to do, but um, this will likely become a common practice to review job descriptions because especially if we're looking at this increasing um, every three years thereafter. And obviously, you know, initial strategy for these changes need to, you need to identify those stakeholders who will be the decision makers and who will actually, you know, progress these projects to be successful. That being said, when you're working on these duties tests, it, it would be beneficial to include the supervisors or managers who really know the, the ins and outs of each role. Um, you may have to, like Josh said, look at job descriptions, evaluations, trainings. Um, and so, like we touched on earlier, I'm guessing some jobs may not have been evaluated for a while. So definitely incorporate some of those um, individuals who would know uh, more detail about what the job entails in and out, like day to day, um, because they need to be up to date if you, you know, you can't just rely on a 10 year old job description or the application or the um, that you've posted to hire for the role. You do need to look a little bit deeper than that. That is very critical. You're, you're exactly right, because it's, you know, the duties and what we stress to our clients, too, is the duties is what they actually do currently. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, we can't necessarily rely on on what a job description uh, may say if it's not accurately reflecting uh, what they do on an everyday basis. Um, so uh, but but looking at, you know, just quickly reviewing this test, you know, part one is it essentially is a three part test. You know, the, the first if we look at the bubble on the left. It's are they paid salary? You know, if not, then they're automatically going to be considered eligible for overtime or non exempt. Um, if they are paid salary, you would go to the, the middle bubble there, the part two, and this is where the, the level comes in. You know, are they in excess of the 844 per week that we're at right now post July 1st? Um, if they are, then you would move to the third part of the test and go through and review what their duties are and determine if they fall in one of the exemption categories. And that that could be the executive, administrative, professional, highly compensated, outside sales. Um, gosh, it, it's they, they refer to it as EAP. Um, but there's about six or seven categories. And, um, and these aren't categories that we suggest that you force employees into. Uh, you want to make sure that they clearly qualify for these. And, 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 it's, and you'll find that this is, this is, this is going to take some time. Um, this is not uh, easy. Uh, it's something that's going to take some consideration. And I think, you know, what Jenica mentioned is pulling in supervisors or stakeholders that are involved or aware of what the employee actually does in their current position is critical, you know, because that's what it, what's going to determine it. Yeah, I, I urge all of the employers to triage as well. You know, there's you have 100 employees, you know, go through the steps, identify, like Josh said at first, are they are they earning a salary? Are they hourly? Where are they in that threshold? And kind of go from easiest to hardest decisions. OK, you're not going to be needing to do a duties test for every employee. But you do need to review and make sure that you are elim you know, eliminating employees to get to that true group that you need to dedicate that time to and really make those strategic decisions. That's great. And, you know, if they do meet all parts of this uh, of this test, uh, the three three part test, then they, they would be deemed exempt from overtime. Um, and one, we did just get a question come in about mm -hmm. um, job duty and uh, the job description and how to evaluate that criteria. This is all um, listed on the Department of Labor website. They have very clear examples of things, but it's um, items like how do they supervise individuals? How 
much of their, like what percentage of their responsibilities are they making independent business decisions? You know, things like that. Um, there are some position specific, task specific. Um, there are some computer employee exemptions, things like that. But um, in general, it has to do with um, authority, management, decision making, those responsibilities. Um, so we can, we'll make a note to uh, send out some resources, but you also, they have some really great examples online um, on the Department of Labor website. Yes, that's great. Thanks, Josh. Yep, we'll go ahead and jump. And just a reminder, um, we, we've already touched on this, but uh, as part of this final rule, um, one part of it is that the salary threshold would increase every three years. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, ha has not been challenged necessarily. I think most of the challenges uh, legally right now are focused on the January 1 increase. Uh, so we don't see any changes to this every three year incremental increase. Um, but just be prepared. This is, I guess, the point here that we want to make is this isn't going away. You know, th this is something that we're going to have to perform uh probably an annual analysis on you know to see did you have any employees that are falling into that category or that gray area of are they exempt are they non-exempt and 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 we'll talk about it in a few slides about why it's in, imperative or critical to know this uh because the repercussions uh, of being out of compliance are are, are fairly uh substantial uh to say the least but um you know, we, we get the question all the time. Um, and one question is, how is this found out? You know, uh, we were talking to a client yesterday and or to a peer group and and, and they ask, you know, well, well, how would this be found out if I'm not in compliance right now? And, you know, it, it typically uh, disgruntled employee uh, makes a claim, um, then they can do that with their with the Department of Labor or they can do that with their state labor department. Um, anytime a claim is made, um, they're going to have to look into it, you know, and, and one thing I want to stress too, is when they look into personnel files, uh, and, and to determine if someone is correctly classified or if they're eligible or not eligible for overtime, they're going to look at your, they're going to look at all of the employees. And, and I think that's where it really compounds the effect of, of, or, or these repercussions, you know, because if they find out that an employee was, you know, deemed exempt and, and they were in fact non-exempt and should have been eligible for overtime, uh, the employer would be responsible for all back pay. Uh, and that, that would be for all overtime back pay that was not paid to that employee. Uh, also, that means payroll taxes. And that's not just the employer portion of the payroll taxes. They would also be responsible for the employee portion of the payroll taxes. Um, and there's a look back period that's a standard for uh, the Department of Labor can look back three years. So like we mentioned earlier, th these exemption um, thresholds and categories have been around for years, um, uh, far past three years ago. So this is something that they could look back at all of your employees. And when, when, that, when it all adds up, um, some of the cases that we've seen are could, could be detrimental to companies uh, because the figures are very, very substantial. So uh, think that, that's why we just want to reiterate um, how important it is to prepare yourself and your organization. Um, One thing, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jenica. No, I was just saying, I mean, these FLSA cases are pretty attractive because they are costly. Um, so to attorneys, you know, I, I looked up a stat and employers face at least 7,000 FLSA cases in federal court each year. And that does not account for state court arbitrations or anything resolved pre-suit. So this is happening. This is happening all over the country. It is prevalent and it is costly. Um, it also lends itself to a class basis or collective, you know, basis. And so I just, yeah, 
Liquidated damages are available. It just, I, we caution you to understand the repercussions of not complying with these changes. Yes, that's, and, and we can't stress it enough. And this is not, you know, fear tactic. What we want you to do is we want you to be knowledgeable of, of these repercussions. You know, we want you to understand um, the risk involved. And, and, and that's why, um, you know, this is a common, this is a common deal, you know, like, like Jenica mentioned, you know, 7,000 cases annually, and that's not even considering the thousands and thousands of cases that, that, um, that aren't, that, that do not go to court, uh, essentially, but, um, and, and attorney's fees too. So if there are attorney's fees involved, then the, the employer could be responsible for that. And, all of this stuff that we've talked about thus far doesn't even involve penalties and or fines. Uh, so if they found out that a certain employer, you know, um, was willful in, in their violation of, of um, you know, miscategorizing employees, or if, um, if they found that they sh in a state of they should have known, um then it can penalties and fines can be added on to the all of these figures so um it, it's it's just an area we don't want to go to uh we want to avoid because our ultimate goal you know with our clients is just to help them avoid things that slow them down you know we, we don't want you to as an organization have to spend time emotion money on you know having to respond to claims so if, if Preparation is key here. There's no doubt about it. And we're living in a world where pay transparency and employees' awareness of what's going on and salary banding and just an understanding of the whole comp world is prevalent. I mean, yeah, employees will be aware of what's going on. Um, and so you just don't, you want to be able to have the answers and you want to be proactive about it so you're not on your heels and on your back foot. Yeah, that's true. I mean, th this is this is so popular in the HR world. I mean, you, you've seen this on the news. So that just reiterates what what Jenica was saying there is um, your employees are going to be aware of this, you know, and, and, and not that you're, you know, no implication that you're, you're trying to uh, not be transparent with your employees. But um, this is something that everyone is just aware of. So it's just, you know, critical to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Mm -hmm. Let's jump over, um, you know, how to prepare. You know, we, we have some clients that have uh, started to prepare, you know, months ago or in April when this first came about. Um, a majority of the clients are, are really just getting involved with that preparation and analysis right now. Um, but the sooner the better. You know, I, I think um, it, the only thing that we can do here that to hurt uh, our organizations would be to wait. You know, I, I think that that's the only risk involved. Um, and, and, you know, just to touch on one thing too, we, we have uh, clients that will ask us, you know, well, you know, in doing our preparation, do we look at the increase, the July 1st increase or the January 1, 25 increase? And we have clients doing it both ways. You know, um, you may, I would suggest probably preparing for the July 1st, that's going to make you familiar with the process that you need to go through. So when you do that again in Q3 or, or Q4, then you will be ready to do that and be more knowledgeable on, on how to do it. Um, and then in the meantime, you know, you don't have to make changes that that could be potentially, you know, um, stayed or uh, injunctions could be applied to. So most of our clients, I would think, are, are kind of just using the number for J July 1st increase right now. Um, but Jenica mentioned earlier too, you know, um, re re review the final rule. There, there are some fairly good, uh, resources on the department of labor. Um, it's a very exhaustive website, uh, but there are some, uh, great resources and we can also follow up and share some, uh, resources that we reference, uh, from time to time, but, uh, reviewing current classifications, you know, uh, reviewing, uh, your compensation and finding out, you know, who is falling in this window of, you know, where we currently were at 35,000 with the salary threshold and where we have increased to, you know, who did that, what does that range encompass? You know, what employees fall within that range? And I think that's what you're, those are the employees we're gonna have to focus on. You know, what what changes are we, are we gonna need to maintain their exempt status, you know, by, 
uh, increase in their salary? Um, are we going to have to transition them to a non-exempt employee to where they would start to track time? Um, you know, evaluate the impact on the business. And this is something that um, it, it's not cut and dry. Um, you may find that, you know, in looking at whether or not to transition an employee from exempt to non-exempt, you know, if that employee has not tracked hours in, in the past as an exempt employee, um, it will be difficult to determine how long they're working and how much that transition to a non-exempt employee will cost the company. Um, but going through the analysis, I think you still can come to a, a close idea of, of how it's going to affect the company. And then potential updates, we're going to provide you with potential updates as they occur. And these are a few um, of the questions that we've received, uh, you know, over the past months, you know, when talking with clients and um, and being part of, of, of peer groups and discussions about this. Um, you know, where I was actually on a, a Department of Labor uh, webinar a week and a half ago where there were 35,000 attendees. Um, so th this just it just to reiterate that this is a very hot topic, you know, but um, one of the questions that that I get most often is, um, well, can we just fix this by we'll just have a no overtime policy? And yes, that, that's completely OK. Um, now, that really doesn't affect whether or not you have to compensate for overtime worked. Um, if any time, as according to the Department of Labor, if any time is suffered, um, then it has to be compensated for. So, yes, you can have a policy that says no overtime, but if overtime is worked, then you must pay that individual. Now, if they did not provide you with prior notice or receive prior approval uh, before working overtime, then that then becomes a, a discipline issue. You know, that, that then becomes a policy violation, but there really is no effect. It, it, it doesn't allow us to avoid paying them overtime if they don't provide us with prior notice. So that's, that, that's been a very popular question that we've had, but we encourage, I mean, there's a lot of employers, I think probably more so than, than not, um, they're going to institute a policy if they don't have one right now. Uh, because this will just make the employee aware that, okay, I'm not supposed to work overtime. I'm going to monitor my time and make my supervisor or whomever I need to aware of when I'm approaching overtime so I can receive prior approval. So we have and just a little bit over two minutes left. We're going to try to get through these FAQs, but we have a bunch of questions that came in as well. We're not okay, going to be great. able to get them, but... Uh, we will be sending out a full FAQ sheet at the end with this recording of the video. It will include those listed on the screen and the questions that we've received during this time. I think some of them will be answered in these last questions we have on here. But like I said, about a minute and a half, two minutes left. So um, anything we don't get to, we will send out. Um, so this next FAQ, how do we calculate hours for employees who don't track hours? So I get it. You have an employee who is reclassified to non-exempt, but they're salaried or they're not used to uh, tracking their hours and they become hourly. Uh, that is why early and clear communication and training is so important. Um, anybody who is non-exempt has to track their hours, whether that's on a piece of paper or electronic timekeeping, it has to be tracked. If you, hourly is a little bit more straightforward, um, but uh, the salaried non-exempt is a little bit of a weird situation. At the end of the day, it is on the employer to track those hours. Even if you've instructed the employee to track their hours, it may, like I said, it may not be electronic timekeeping. It may just be an email sent in each week mm -hmm. with your hours. If they don't do that, it's still on you as the employer to pay them their overtime. That being said, asterisk. If they don't get you those hours by the time it's the payroll, that's not saying, oh, we missed it. That's no big deal. That overtime would be reflected on the next paycheck. So as long as you can prove that you are supplying that overtime based on those hours worked. Um, and so no matter who they are, if they are not exempt, they have to track hours. It, like I said, it doesn't matter the method. It just has to be done. Um, You're right. Josh, I mean, the, 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the Department of Labor, just to add on just a little bit, the Department of Labor is looking for a record, you know, and, and there's no guidance on what that record is. It could be electronic um, or it could be, you know, just a, a spreadsheet. Uh, it could be handwritten. Um, but in the absence uh, of a timekeeping record, um, that, that's a situation where you don't want to be caught. Um, there's actually a Department of Labor and their agents or auditors actually have their own method of determining the time worked for those individuals that do not have time records. We don't, we, we can't elaborate on that, um, but that's just a situation that we want to avoid completely. Awesome. We are actually out of time. I don't want to keep people past the time that we promised, but it, we are ending in a decent place where we just have these FAQs that we can roll in, like I said, to the questions that came in uh, while we've been speaking. I really appreciate everybody joining us today. Josh, thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any questions um, about compliance or about our services here at Dominion Payroll, please feel free to reach out to Josh or um, we'll include an email on the FAQ uh, distribution that we sent with this recording. Um, yeah, thank you, Josh. That sounds great. And thank you, Jenica, and thank you to everyone who attended today. Perfect. Bye. Take care.